Hello. It's going to be a reaction video, but first I want to take a moment to acknowledge the technical mastery of this zoom effect on my uh, laptop camera, uh, which is a button in the bottom right corner of the window, the camera window that I had never touched before, and it turns out it's a zoom. So uh, enjoy that. Enjoy the special effects. But now I see that my eyes are completely in darkness. That's good. This is a dark video anyway, I guess. So it's a reaction to uh, ethics, uh, uh, an ethics question that Kevin Toll wrote called, Can You Separate Art from the Artist? I saw this on Steve Donahue's channel. He didn't want people to mention him. He wanted people just to mention, just to make sure they, they link to Kevin, and I, and I will do that. You definitely want to check out Kevin's channel if you haven't. It's a great channel, and he's uh, only got uh, 400 and something subscribers, so he could use some more. It's only a three-minute video, so there's really no excuse not to watch it if you're interested in the question at all of Ken separating the artist from the artist, which I've talked about before, but some of my opinions probably got lost in, in, in the back end, the gutter, as I call them, the swamp of my videos when I'm talking 10, 15, 20 minutes longer than anybody has any interest in listening to. Um, and also because uh, some of Steve Donahue's responses in, in his response video uh, really resonated with me about cancel culture that I had never heard described so well as, as he had described them. So I thought there was enough to talk about. So, But the main question from, and maybe I'll get to that or probably I'll forget, but Kevin's main question was, could you separate the art from the artist? This, of course, has to do with uh, Neil Gaiman, particularly right now, uh, many others in the past, uh, J.K. Rowling, as, as Steve mentioned in his video, was d different authors that have been canceled for different reasons, sometimes for actual crimes they've committed or or things that would be considered crimes now you go you go all the way back this was never an issue in the past this is an issue since social media i think because you know when i was young punk rocker reading uh william burroughs naked lunch and queer and and the western lands and all his books you know you never really thought about not reading them because he he got off for murdering his wife. Well, you could call it manslaughter. He murdered her. He was drunk. They were all drunk. They were playing games, uh, target practice games, putting an, called the William Tell game, where he put something on her head, an apple, or I don't think it was actually an apple, it was a glass or something, to shoot it off, ended up shooting her in the head and killing her. It was in Mexico in the 50s. He uh, was not charged for it because it was a, it was an accident, but it was an accident that I think we would all realize today where the person, you know, it'd be some level of manslaughter, the most egregious, I think, is just, you know, such irresponsible behavior at most. I think he even would be charged as second degree murder because, I mean, you can't shoot a gun at somebody and just, uh, and you know, intentionally shoot a gun knowing it's going to go off and just trusting on your ability not to hit the person, uh, whether whether you intended to or not. But anyway, you know, but we never considered don't read his books because of that reason. Uh, flash forward a few years to James Tiptree Jr., um, who is a science fiction writer. Her, her real name was Alice Sheldon. She's a fantastic writer, mostly short stories. One of the great 1970s uh, science fiction writers. It was that era just before cyberpunk that was one of the last great eras of science fiction. Cyberpunk was, and this was the second to last. Where, uh, and she was probably the best writer up to emerge in that time. She was older when she started publishing her science fiction. She wrote one story when she was younger, but... Anyway, her life ended in murder-suicide when she um, uh, shot her husband, who was even older than her and herself. There's a great biography of James Tiptree Jr., of Alice Sheldon. Um, 
So this happened in the early 80s, I would guess. Uh, she did this from her point of view because uh, they were both older and uh, it was kind of a, I forget what you call this kind of murder, but she felt like uh, she was too old to take care of her husband. She didn't want to leave him alone. And he was not able to take care of himself. So, you know, kind of a, a euthanasia slash suicide or something. You know, there's some discussion later on, uh, particularly in, in that biography that I read of her, which is excellent, that, you know, maybe there's some doubt about that. Maybe she just really wanted to kill herself. She wanted, she was, uh, you know, she's a, de a depressed person, as many writers, and she had wanted to kill herself for quite a while. And she may have just convinced herself that that her husband agreed to this, or he might have not had the mental capacity to agree to to submit to this pact that she left, you know, letters to indicate that, that they had made. And, you know, so it's hard to say, but, uh, you know, at the time when I was reading science fiction, this wasn't even mentioned in the trade magazines and different things that came out. It was just that she had died, and I thought, that oh, she died, she was in her late 60s, but nothing about the circumstances. I'm sure in the local paper, whatever there were, but... You know, so much to the degree that there was later at WizCon and the WizCon um, Science Fiction Convention had a a prize, a, a big annual prize for the best feminist science fiction. She's considered a, a feminist writer. I, I think that's kind of limiting. But anyway, uh, or uh, so they, they created the James Tiptree Award and it was for... A, and it was to be for books that were that question around gender, or took new takes on gender, or uh, or feminism, or any of those broadly speaking those kind of, of things. And they thought she was the perfect person to name this award after. Besides being an excellent writer, she was also a woman who disguised herself as a man for most of her writing careers for as long as she could. She came out. It turned out, you know, people found out eventually. She was able to keep it secret from everybody for quite a while uh, by you know not even telling editors that she was that she was a woman she had she managed to you could never do this today, but she managed to actually get a checking account a bank account in this in this name James Tiptree jr and that's all really she needed you know to cash the checks was just some bank account that's got the same name as the checks. You know, now today, if people want to hide that, like like uh, J.K. Rowling wanted to do with Robert Galbraith, uh, with that pen name, she had to you know hire lawyers and you know make it a big secret, you know, because she wanted to keep it secret from her publisher too. She wanted to prove that she could be in uh, two great writers. Um, you know, of course, somebody blabbed, um, and Richard Bachman, Stephen King, he. His pen name was secret from the public, Richard Bachman, but it was never secret from his publishers. He, they, they knew it was Stephen King when they were publishing Rick, Richard Bachman's books. So that, that uh, leaked out too because a, a book, re a reader, book collector, I think, book uh, seller, just finally figured out. He just felt that the Bachman books were so similar in style to King that they had to be written by the same person, and which is why when you see contests, you know, for anon anonymous writers, submit your stories anonymously or not. There's really no such thing as anonymous. If you're any kind of good writer at all, any halfway decent competent writer, people are going to be able, able to figure it out if you have enough stuff written in your name, unless you're just absolute genius with multiple personalities. I don't know how I got off on all this. So this is just to say, so oh, oh anyway, so this, 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 this award called the James Triptree Jr. Award, which they used to give out every year uh, after the biography came out and after people realized how Alice Sheldon's life ended and, and um, concerns over uh, ableism, I guess, because cause is what they were concerned about. They weren't con so much concerned with elder abuse because woke people don't care about that. They care about uh, 
ableism, though, and so they felt that uh, she was not deserving of having an award named after her, even though it's not not named after her, it's named after her pen name. So it's very clearly meant to, the award was meant to honor her writing and to celebrate her writing and to award people who were writing in that tradition. But, uh, and they claim they didn't do this for PC reasons, but of, of course they did. People wrote in, they're complaining, how can you have an award named after this woman, named after the pen name of this woman who murdered her husband, who was a diminished, who was in a wheelchair, was, or, you know, who was um, not able to take care of himself, and she murdered him and then murdered herself. So they changed it to the Starburst Award, the Sunbright Award, the Starbright Award, the Lightbright Award, something like that, some innocuous thing that they'll never get in trouble for. So... Uh, But so this is, you know, this is how people, there was that whole period where people are trying to deal with writers of the past, like Lovecraft, of course. People used to d deal with all these things, and this is what I was trying to get to originally talking about Tiptree in the 70s when no one in like Locust Magazine or book forwards or anything that came out in their books later even mentioned this. God forbid they mentioned this this element of reality, this very ugly and sad ending to her life because it was just, oh, shut up about it or, oh, it's not, it's not what you think or... Uh, and that's not good either. You know, a lot of people you read, not so much anymore, but for a while I used to read people who would just straight up deny Lovecraft's anti-Semitism, anti... Uh, and and racism... They straight up deny it. Say it was he was just a normal uh, person of his time with the normal attitudes. When it's not, he was, he was very much a white supremacist. At least for much of his life, he may have tempered his views later in life, which is good, as we all should do. And he and if he'd even lived longer, he might have tempered them more. But I, I don't think the uh, so I think that was a bad uh, precedent that was set for many years where people just deny stuff. Just deny it. It's not happened. It's all in your head, or it's your imagination, or everybody was like that back then. That's not good either. But when it comes to canceling people, and I know, I know the uh, discussion is more about people who are still alive. Anyway, so over the years, I've known, uh, I've encountered so many types of these type of writers, and much younger people than me are more concerned with these about making sure that everyone knows they have the right opinions about a writer and this is where I thought uh, Steve Donahue's description of cancel culture that he went into in his video about halfway through I think is we talked about how it's not f for the woke uh, scolds it's not enough for them to uh, stop reading a writer who they find obnoxious it's not enough for them to declare that they find the writer obnoxious they then they then have to go around and shame other people and make sure that other people join their side you know and i've seen this on twitter many times when when some bad actor and they're usually i've seen so many of these on twitter because i used to follow a lot of writers and and small publishers and things and you know especially like in the horror small press community that's a big one for this kind of stuff. Any kind of small press, any kind of low stakes arts where there's no money involved and there's just people and egos and, uh, you know, someone will uh, behave badly and, and literally literally a nobody. I mean, in the real world, a nobody, but somebody who in the, in the world of small presses maybe published uh, a couple of anthologies uh, where they've paid people zero dollars and... And, uh, you know, for the clout or whatever. Or they've published a few stories in these type of anthologies. And they've been on a lot of convention panels. And some of them turn out to be not good people. Like sexual harassers or whatever. And, and so these beefs start. Uh, and then people will go around and search out. And not only in those cases, but also in, in bigger cases like... Uh, Diamond or Joss Whedon or whoever it is uh, will go in and, and sort of suss out who's following who on Twitter. Like, you follow this person. I'm, I better, you know, you'll see tweets like, I better 
and I find out that any of my followers are following person X or person Y, you know, because, you know, that's sort of some sort of endorsement. And some people might just be obliviously floating along, enjoying some writer like, uh, what's a good example? Uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley, without having read any trade journals, any any uh, list serves or whatever they used to have uh, about uh, the terrible things she did. Um, you can Google that for yourself if you're interested in Marion Zimmer Bradley. Um, you know, somebody might just be blithely along, but they have to be told and warned off and told that they're enabling this this person by by enjoying their books, enjoying their legacy. And it really never stops, as Steve said, because pretty much anybody in the past took behaved in a way that we would find morally reprehensible now, unless he mentions, actually he mentions Robert Howard, and of course Robert Howard, you know, as someone who's largely blameless, probably, we don't know, but, you know, there's a person who died at 30, so I guess if if you can read enough, if you can find enough authors and people who, who stopped writing at 20 or 30, but, you know, then you've got Rambeau, who's a despicable person, who's a... Um, seem like, you know, stopped writing at 20 or something and went to Africa to run a plantation and torture uh, the natives and the local people. And so the decision I came to a long time ago was I, I don't cancel authors because it's not sustainable. What I find very often is people love canceling authors that they already don't like. You know, it's easy for me to cancel Neil Gaiman and uh, because I really always thought he was overrated. It's easy for me to cancel J.K. Rowling because I didn't really enjoy those books that much. And I wouldn't say they're overrated. They're just not for me. I, um, uh, I'm trying to think of somebody I was... You know, there are other people you hear off every so often that I don't care about that much either way. I'm not like, uh, who's the guy who wrote uh, Lone Ranger and Tano, uh, Fist Fight in Hell? Uh, what's that guy's name? He got canceled for some sexual harassment stuff. And I didn't care either way. I mean, I think he's a pretty good writer, but he's not. it's not going to you know devastate me either way. So it's really the only ones that are really troublesome are, the, are it's when you really like someone. Like I used to really like Josh Whedon's TV shows. I used to like Woody Allen's movies. I'm really trying to think of a writer whose behavior has made me change their opinion of them. And it isn't usually because usually it's been people who are long dead when I started reading them. Or people who I don't like. For this is an advantage, I guess, of writing of liking mostly dead authors. You know, there's a, there's stuff you could pick out in anybody. You know, uh, particularly anybody who ever wrote about sex or gender in any kind of way. And you could also go the other way and say they never wrote about anybody except exactly themselves. So if you you might have a writer who's, uh, let's say, a, a white male writer from the Upper East Side of Manhattan who wrote 30 books and never mentioned uh, anybody but other white uh, people. And you might say, well, there's no evidence that they're racist, but you could also, from the woke point of view, go and say, well, see, they just, they centered whiteness and they and they didn't acknowledge these other people that were around. So even if you've never done or said anything overtly racist, or overtly sexist, you could be considered those things simply by omission. You know, I'm sure uh, well, anyway, I want to go on to some other other uh, topics because I will say, I think that this woke stuff is, is there's a movie out now called Am I Racist? which I haven't seen and and I probably won't. Some people are really enjoying it. It's, it's a right-wing movie mockumentary about uh, race grifters. And I kind of feel like... It seems like it's doing pretty well. I kind of... I, 
And people on the left are ignoring it, and people on the right are saying, ah, they're afraid of our truth, you know, they're... The, the, you know they don't want to engage with it I, what I really think is going on with that movie is it didn't come out five years ago it's coming out now and if it had come out five years ago every uh, PC wokester would be freaking out about it and attacking it and they're not because I kind of think this stuff has peaked I really do. I th- I really think this wokeism has peaked, and I don't want to get super political because I'll a- alienate half the people, but or maybe I'll a- alienate two thirds of the people because, like like everyone else, my politics are all mixed up. There's nobody's consistent on their politics. But like I'm pretty much on the left, but I really don't like the woke left. You know, you look at the difference in, and I'm not advocating for any candidate or against any other candidate. Candidate, you look at the difference between the way Kamala Harris is campaigning and the way Hillary Clinton campaigned, which Hillary Clinton's campaign was centered on uh, men. They just keep us down. You thank God we're here to, you know, I've have, you know, I know how to take care of Congress because I know about uh, arrogant men. You know, and you're making jokes about her husband and stuff and. And Kamala seems to be, uh, you know, she's really not, I mean, love her or hate her or, or not care or think that she's a tool of the system or think that she's a revolutionary. And I, I think she's as much a tool of the system as any of the rest of them. I'm pretty uh, anti-politician. Um, she's really just running. You know, these are my, these are the things we stand for. And I'm not going to be very specific on them because I want to, I want everybody from Dick Cheney, to, Dick Cheney, to uh, to the to to every Alec Baldwin. I want them all to endorse me. And she she's not really hitting those uh, those gender cards. And it's not all about I'm going to be the first woman of color of, of you know. She's really just kind of campaigning as a as a mainstream Democrat. And I think that's because of this woke stuff. People are tired of it. And I think even the people. Um, who who like to use it for bait see it's not working as much anymore and that's why this movie's this this Matt I forget his last name this am I racist movie coming out now is not that big a deal to people on the left and and people on the right they're enjoying it and people in the middle they're just enjoying it as a stupid comedy and it's always fun to see people it's always fun to see elites uh, you know and, and these are people like uh you know these race baiting elites who are trying to who grift a lot of money off trying to teach you how to you know you pay the money and they tell you you're less racist because you paid the money um kind of thing i wish i hadn't talked about that so much because i'm probably gonna deal with it in the comments but so i i on the plus side i think sort of this has it's gone on enough it's like the salem witch trials pretty soon everybody's accusing everybody else of being a witch so there's just nowhere else it can go you know everybody's racist everybody's sexist every everybody's uh they're either uh misandry is that how you say a man hater or they're anti-feminist or you know it's like every everybody's bad on somebody else's level so they can't really go much farther on that uh, which is why I think a lot of the wokeism it's just it's just losing its bite because you can only call a person who's not a racist a racist so many times and they're just not going to care and if they are a racist they're not going to care either so it worked for a while because people want to be uh, who people who think of themselves as good people and are afraid that they're, maybe they're not inside maybe they're afraid that they're not they freak out if people would accuse them of being a uh, holding extreme views that they don't have just you know they happen to read uh, Neil Gaiman they happen to uh, retweet yay season three of, of, of is coming out of of Sandman or whatever and you know and then people you know are going to write in and say you know write back to them and go, oh I don't I guess you don't know. I guess you hate women because if you're if you're supporting Neil Gaiman's work you must hate women you know, and we have to do the kind of the the genuflect now. You have to do this on on the on the left. If you criticize, if if I want to criticize 
Kamala Harris on on anything, for example. I should go back one election cycle, just be sure. If I want to criticize Joe Biden, uh, his mental acuity, uh, I have to, online, I have to explicitly say this is not an endorsement of Donald Trump. I had to, at least, you know, because there's, we're really in a, in a, in the United States, we're in this divide where all people will come back at you with, if you criticize anything on your side, they'll say, oh, you must like Trump then. Oh, you must like Trump. Or if you say anything um, against Trump and you're on, on, on the, the right, you know, there's a lot of people on the right, they call them rhinos, Republican in name only. If, if any of them criticize Trump, it's like, oh, I guess you're really just a shit little bit, you know. So it's, it's the extremes demand 100% orthodoxy, 100% fealty. And it just is getting to the point where I, I don't believe it works so much anymore. And most people are like, you know, I don't know, what are you going to do? I guess, okay, I guess, I, I guess I'm racist. Okay, I guess I hate men, whatever, whatever you want to say. Uh, I, guess, I guess so. I guess so. Because you can't be, just can't have a society where just every single, every single thing you say all the time, day and night, can be uh, accused of the, of the worst, can be um, summarized by some random person on Twitter as making you the worst person in the world because you didn't know, for example, that about, you didn't hear about the uh, Neil Gaiman controversy. So that's the other end of the spectrum. We had one spectrum was just to deny everything. They're just all making it up. You know, that was what happened before Me Too. It's like uh, all these women are, they're just lying about how Hollywood treated them. And then, you know, but of course now that's flipped too because now uh, people on the right, you know, they, they've, Realize that talking about the Me Too movement is a really great cudgel against the left because most of the people that got Me Too'd in Hollywood were uh, big uh, Democrat funders, you know, Weinstein and and Epstein and you know people like that. There's, there's so many pictures of them with the Clintons and and with uh, right wingers too, but. You know, in, in Hollywood, you you fund Democrats. That's what you do. Just like on Wall Street, you uh, just like in Silicon Valley, it used to be you'd fund Democrats. They're switching now to Republicans, I think, based on what Elon Musk is always talking about. Um, you know, Hollywood's a Democrat town. It's like Hawaii and Washington State, where I grew up, uh, where I lived for many years too. But also, Hawaii is. Um, is a state that's wholly Democrat. That doesn't mean there aren't Republicans there. That doesn't mean there aren't Republicans in office. It means if they want to be in office, they run as Democrats, which is why you have someone like Tulsi Gabbard, who's now uh, a Trump supporter. She was a Democrat, but she wasn't a Democrat the way that that uh, someone in the Midwest is where there's two facts. It's like, if you're going to be in politics in Hawaii, you have to be a Democrat. So what ends up happening in a place like that is Chamber of Commerce Democrats, business-friendly Democrats versus more social program-aligned Democrats. And who do you think always wins? It's the Chamber of Commerce always wins. That's what I've been in Seattle my whole life that I, I lived there. There would always be, we have open primaries there, um, which means you could vote for anybody, uh, e either party. You just, so a parties, parties effectively don't matter as a voter because you go in, there's four people on the ballot. Like say it's for mayor, you go in, there's like eight names on there. So, you know, there's goofballs at the end, like, like, like like Gary Goodspaceman or something. I forget what his name was. You know, cranks that are on there all the time that, that manage to work the system so they can always get on the ballot. Then there'll be like, and then, then there'll be a Republican guy who's a legitimate Republican candidate, but uh, he's just some goof that the, the party, since the party has to um, nominate somebody or not save face, 
you know, or, or lose face, um, they have to, so they get, you know, some big donor or something, or, hey, you could be our, our candidate, and you could put that on all your letterheads. I was the, the Republican mayoral candidate in 2022 for Seattle, even though it's always a Democrat. And then the top three will be Democrats, and they'll be like a, a very extreme left-wing Democrat who's like, I want to, you know, destroy the, the, you know, let's eat the rich. There'll be a moderately uh, left-wing Democrat, like a Bernie Sanders type, and then there'll be a pro-business Democrat who's like, you know, a, a, a former board member of uh, the cable company or something. Or, and uh, and it's top two. So uh, I would always vote for the most extreme radical left-winger. Um, they would immediately get knocked out, as would the Republicans. So the, 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 the general election would be between top two, top two vote getters, which would be two Democrats. The moderate, say Ber- Bernie Sander level uh, Democrat, and the moderate Chamber of Commerce, pro business, not in my backyard, uh, yuppie Democrat. And who do you think wins every time? Every time. The, the Republican Democrat, the business friendly Democrat, you know, but if, if they had a fair party system in, uh, in Washington, that person would have been a Republican. Um, cause that's where the money goes. You know, the, the money goes, it's, it's a Democrat do- nominated state. So the money goes, you know, there might be, a, there might be enough activism, uh, momentum around like one particular city council person like we had uh uh one for a while i think she retired now who's a socialist and you can get enough people to together that are activists young people university students and things like that to get one of those people in but for the most part the money goes to the person who wants to you know keep taxes low and uh you know get rid of uh, any anything uh, that's uh, citizen friendly and not business friendly, and you know that's where that's where the money goes. That's who the property owners vote for, and that person could be Republican or Democrat. Doesn't matter. Boy, am I, I am way off topic. Shit. All right, so I don't think anybody's still listening to this rant anymore, but which is unfortunate because there was other stuff I wanted to talk about about other people because the main question is separating the art from the artist fuck I really messed this up by going off on that rant about politics anyway I'm almost thinking about doing another video but I guess I won't so there's another kind of separating the artist from the artist that I don't I haven't heard anybody else talk about yet and I guess I'll have to put it in another video because no one's going to listen to it this long alright that's my ramble on this topic for today.